The small island of 513 people had just lost a key technical backbone to a bombing. To fill this void, they issued a recruitment notice, which immediately attracted a large number of applicants from outside the island who had long dreamed of such an opportunity. However, Helgoland only needed capable and skilled individuals. Eventually, they selected two doctors from the numerous applicants. The interview was conducted by Dr. Mark on the island, who asked both candidates questions based on medical knowledge from textbooks. The responses from both the black and white candidates were professional and impeccable. The island's management was pleased with their performance. However, only one person could be chosen to live on the island. So, Lise initiated a vote as usual. The white candidate was accepted with a narrow margin of one vote. Mark, who cast the deciding vote, was not racially biased. In his view, the white candidate's surgical expertise held more technical value. Upon learning the interview results, Yuri, the water plant engineer, was almost devastated because the black candidate was his wife. For years, he had worked tirelessly just to bring his wife to the island. Yuri, in despair, told Lisa he wanted to leave, but the response he received stunned him in place. Tut mir leid, aber ich kann sie nicht gehen lassen. Ich brauche sie. Ich meine wegen der Wasserwiederaufbereitungsanlage. By the way, if you enjoy our movie recaps, we're currently hosting a giveaway for our audience. We're excited to announce that a brand new scooter awaits one lucky subscriber. Don't miss out. Subscribe and follow us to stay tuned for more updates. Meanwhile, Dr. Mark conducted a blood test on his son, but the results left him somewhat hopeless. Luckily, the medication his son brought back was genuine. It seemed the only solution now was to go to the mainland. Mark informed Lisa of this news, hoping to get permission to leave the island to find medicine to save his son. However, Lisa showed no interest in developing antiviral vaccines. To her, without the virus, there would be no power. At the same time, she also wanted Mark to conceal the fat boy's condition because Lisa didn't want the islanders to panic. On the other side, the abandoned Henry encountered a healthy old grandmother on the mainland. He was curious how the old woman managed to survive the virus's onslaught. The old woman told him the method was simple. Maintain distance and disinfect with alcohol, but one must be careful not to get it on clothes, because that's how her daughter was burned alive. In the laboratory, Mark, lacking his capable assistant, his son, had to bring in a deputy physician for help. Mark had never passed on his medical skills over the years. In this dog-eat-dog -dog post-apocalyptic world, without unique skills, Teaching apprentices could easily lead to the demise of the master. Today, he ordered the gods to go to the mainland and capture two people for experimentation. Although these two individuals were as thin as sticks, they weren't infected with the virus. Mark's purpose in capturing them was surprisingly to conduct live experiments, injecting the virus into their bodies and then using his own vaccine to see if it could detoxify. The whole process was entirely left to fate. The deputy physician, upon learning the truth, was deeply shocked. But in order to learn the technology of vaccine development from Mark, he ultimately chose to remain silent. However, before the experiment results came out, the fat team member was given a meal box. Mark's son watched them being carried away. Although his father hadn't told him the test results, he seemed to already know his fate. A few days later, the residents of the small island gathered together. The fat boy's name had been removed from the scoreboard, indicating a vacancy. After a brief moment of silence for the fat boy, Lise took the lead in accusing the incident. She believed the blame should fall on the captain of the guard, who should be demoted and docked points as punishment. The captain, of course, vehemently objected. Beatrice, jetzt sind wir doch mal ehrlich. Wer schickt uns denn aufs Festland? Als Kanonenfutter an vorderster Front, um unser Leben zu riskieren und für euch die Drecksarbeit zu erledigen. Seeing the scene escalating, Lisa exerted her power. Almost everyone voted to support her decision. 
while Mark, casting his vote against, lowered his head. Although he knew it was futile resistance, he had always adhered to his principles over the years. At this moment, there was a violent cough from the last row of the venue. Although these underage individuals temporarily lacked voting rights, they were already tired of the power struggles on the island. Accompanied by increasingly loud coughs, the uninformed residents immediately covered their faces and fled for their lives. The next day, Lisa called for an emergency meeting to discuss the incident where young people openly challenged her authority. Lisa came up with a solution. Although there was a provision on the island that exempted underage individuals from punishment, if they were tied to their parents and their misdeeds affected their parents' points, it could effectively manage these young people. Mark, finding this absurd, reluctantly raised his hand in opposition, but the voting result was clear. On the mainland, the Count found the dead drug courier by the shore. From him, his men found a bottle of unexpired vaccine. The Count immediately ordered his men to capture the drug courier's companions. Among the crowd, one arrogant person stood out. After some thought, the cunning Count realized his close relationship with the deceased drug courier. As expected, he told the Count where the drugs were hidden and that there were advanced experimental equipment on the ship. Knowing the Count's desire to occupy the small island, he proposed to exchange conditions. In exchange for revealing the location of the drugs and equipment, he wanted to be taken to live on the island. The Count readily agreed to this request. In the apocalypse, having both weapons and food would easily enable one to dominate a continent. Although the Count was a king on the mainland, he had grown tired of the disgusting rabbit burgers and set his sights on Helgoland Island, which was rich in resources. Not only did it have fresh fruits and vegetables, but also a doctor capable of deciphering viruses. For years the Count had been waiting for the right moment to attack, and the son of the island's ruler they had just captured was the key to realizing his dream. Henry, who was cowardly and afraid of death, spilled all the information about the small island. He not only revealed the defense vulnerabilities of Helgoland, but also volunteered to lead the Count. On the other side of the small island, there was turmoil brewing. Underage Fiona accidentally got pregnant after tasting forbidden fruit. Knowing the severe consequences without quarters, her selfish mother, to safeguard her own points, secretly put abortion pills into her tea. Fiona had a rebellious boyfriend like herself, who was imprisoned by Lisa's men for refusing military service. Seeing the younger generation becoming increasingly difficult to manage, Lisa sought out their leader, Fiona, promising her a more decent job. However, Fiona was tired of their petty games and would rather continue cleaning toilets than compromise her principles. Meanwhile, the only power station on the small island encountered problems. The administrator inadvertently found a bottle of top-quality liquor in the toolbox. Faced with this currently scarce treasure, the administrator immediately hid it away secretly. He ended up getting heavily drunk during work. At this moment, Engineer Yuri arrived at the power station. His resentment towards the island for refusing his wife's entry had festered in him. Feeling trapped in a place where he couldn't come and couldn't escape, Yuri lost all motivation to live. He ruthlessly smashed the main axis of the windmill. The intoxicated administrator could only stare blankly in the control room, knowing he would be docked points for his negligence. He risked his life and climbed up the windmill to try to remedy the situation. Soon, the ambulance brought the administrator to Dr. Mark's clinic. Since Mark and the deputy physician were not experts in surgery, and the recently hired white candidate had not arrived yet, they had to make the decision to amputate to save his life. As the surgery neared its end, the fake doctor finally arrived. Mark called her to come and help immediately, but she nervously ran outside to stall for time. Afterwards, Mark immediately exposed her identity as a fake doctor. It turns out the fake doctor had done his homework thoroughly to be able to get onto the island. 
he memorized thick medical textbooks word for word, and combined with the basic knowledge he had learned as a yoga instructor, he understood everything except surgery. His efforts to come here were not solely for this purpose. The fake doctor claimed to be able to save Mark's son, and even said the island would soon undergo changes. Just as Mark was left dumbfounded by this revelation, the deputy physician burst in angrily. She had heard their entire conversation clearly. For years, she had been subordinate to Mark, and this resentment and frustration drove her mad. After venting her anger, the deputy physician intended to report to Lisa, but the mysterious fake doctor certainly wouldn't let him leave. <laughs> Mark was stunned by this fierce woman. He even suspected the fake doctor was a martial arts coach. Despite her malicious intent, Mark didn't intervene. At this moment, he believed his son's life was more important. Therefore, he witnessed the fake doctor's final fatal blow. Shortly after, the deputy physician's disappearance raised suspicion from Lisa. He successfully found evidence at the scene. But he knew Mark was irreplaceable on the island, and even a heinous criminal wouldn't be punished. Therefore, his purpose in coming here wasn't to seek accountability, but to ensure support for himself in tomorrow's vote.